Well, hi folks, and welcome to episode 177 of Retro Power and Cut. And we're going to start here by the metal shop lift. Uh, and we've got our next two projects neatly stacked. We've got the Jaguar XJ Coupe, which Mark has just finished stripping, uh, just two days ago finished stripping that. So that's all ready for cleaning now, getting back to bare metal. And that will be a job for next week. We're going to do that the old fashioned way with the blowtorch, the scraper and the blaster. Uh, just briefly elaborating on the water jet uh, process that I referred to previously. I have ducks beginning to get in a row on that, but I still don't have them in a row in time to do this car. So watch this space on that one. We will be doing uh, a trial on that and hopefully bringing that process here. However, we're not going to do it on that car. I can't get everything ready in time to be able to do it on that shell because we kind of want to do this shell next week. So that's where we're at on XJ Coupe. It does, what I will just say is it does look to be a really good shell. We've now, now Mark's got it completely stripped back to the bare bones. It does look pretty good. There is going to be some rot in it. It's had half a sill fitted one side fairly badly uh, and it needs a sill definitely fitting the other side. So both the sills need redoing. I imagine there's going to be some inner structure uh, trauma inside those sills because I doubt anybody will have attended to that when they did the outer parts. Uh, and there are a few other areas. The rear valance has got some crustiness in it. Uh, there's some bits around the window apertures I think Mark mentioned last week. There are var various bits of crustiness on it. But in the scheme of, uh, in the scheme of XJ Coupes, I have to say, it is a really, really good shell. It's very low mileage, which probably helps, but it is a really good shell. Like I say, it's had a light restoration, which hides things as well. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very good basis, I think. We'll reserve judgment fully until after blasting, as always, but it does look a really solid basis. Then we come on to Audi Quattro, which, um, we, which was blasted earlier this week. I actually blasted this one. Uh, it's a while since I've blasted a car and a couple of things. One, it's good to keep your hand in. Uh, and two, I wanted to just refresh my memory, or collective memory here, as to how hard it was to remove a uh, factory PVC sealer using the blaster and just to just in case we were putting a lot of effort into going for the um, sorry let's re let's recap on that slightly one of the problems with using the blowtorch and scraper method for cleaning the body shell prior to blasting is that the PVC sealer used by a lot of the German manufacturers uh, Porsche Audi VW BMW uh, use copious quantities on their 1980s and 90s cars uh, Japanese manufacturers to some extent but not quite as bad and Peugeot also used it a lot as well Peugeot 205s I remember being particularly uh, well well coated in it um, but removing that sealer with a blowtorch and scraper is very very difficult uh, a wire wheel on a grinder actually probably works better to be honest however removing the bitumen type sealers with a blowtorch and scraper works really well that's very fast and easy to do um, I just wanted to refresh my memory of whether I was creating a, a problem from nowhere uh, by um, saying that it was very hard to remove that sealer with the blaster. However, having gone and done that earlier this week, I can confirm it is almost impossible to remove the thick areas of that sealer with the blaster. Once in a lot of areas on these body shells, that could be up to 10 millimetres thick. And to remove that, it's painfully slow. Remembering that our blasting setup is, re in, in commercial blasting terms, isn't that powerful. But in terms of automotive blasting, it's a pretty powerful setup. You know, it's pretty capable of removing coating, removing paint uh, and removing rust. It's, it pretty much removes it as fast as you can move the nozzle. Whereas removing that sealer, it's painfully slow and, uh, and just totally the wrong process. So that was worth me doing. Uh, and, I, and also, strangely, strangely to most of the guys here, I actually quite enjoy blasting because I'm kind of in my little zone in there cleaning. It's quite therapeutic, actually. It's quite a, it's quite, I actually quite enjoy doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, we've, we've got the car blasted. It's all back to bare, uh, bare metal and then had a very light dust coat of uh, etch primer over it just to prevent it flash rusting. We've got a pretty good dryer on the air on the blasting setup now, so we don't really suffer flash rust anyway, but it's always best just to put a coating on just so that it looks reasonable and doesn't, doesn't create flash rust that then we have to busy ourselves trying to remove with the final blast after metal work. Uh, getting down to the next operations on this car, they will be getting it mounted to a select jig and creating a fixture set for it. We often hire the fixture sets from uh, Select through a company in the UK called Body Shop Solutions, who are the sort of UK Select agent. 
However, they don't have a fixture set for one of these in the UK. It's got to come from France, and basically the price is ludicrous. Uh, it's a week minimum higher. Uh, the daily charge is obscene, uh, and the shipping charge is obscene to get the, um, the, the uh, fixtures from France to here. Basically, it's just, it's just ludicrous. It, it, it adds over a thousand pounds worth of cost to simply a, an operation that we would undertake in a day and a half, probably, uh, in terms of getting it on the original fixtures. Because um, what we would usually do is fixture the car and then recreate a fixture set of our own that was generally slightly different to the original fixture set, but that picked up in the places we wanted to pick up in that were out of the way of areas we needed to modify. What we're going to do with this is use a set of chassis drawings which uh, are conveniently available online uh, and create our own fixture set, which we would be doing anyway. So, yeah, we're not hiring the fixtures, long and short of it. If, if they were reasonably priced, we would. They're not reasonably priced. So note to select, bring your fixture costs down. Um, I believe they are doing something about that with their chameleon um, setup, actually. They make, they make an adjustable fixture set uh, so that you don't have to have individual fixture sets for every vehicle. However, the initial outlay on the chameleon set is also just way more than I could ever recoup for, for doing this type of work. I believe it's somewhere in the region of £65,000 um, to initially buy uh, the, fi the chameleon fixture set. I may, I'll be corrected on that. Hopefully Celette will uh, watch this video and make a comment or even, uh, or even offer us a demo of a, uh, of a chameleon set. You never know. Anyway, that's the first job. Get that on the, uh, on the fixtures, on the Select uh, jig bench. Then we can check that the shell is all straight. I can see there's been a few traumas in the past on this car. It appears to have had a new chassis leg on this side at some point in the past. So I think it had a bump early on in its life quite possibly. So we need to just check everything straight there. It needs various rock repairs, the sills need replacing, but we'll probably tie that into the modifications to the body structure anyway, as the, as the outer part of the sill is the actual, there is no other reinforcement to the sill, that is the sill entirely. So we'll probably modify the sills and use that as part of the body modification. We also want to tie the sill structure into a, an enlarged A-pillar structure and tie all of that into the inner wing in this area we want to add a lot of reinforcement in this area that ties into the a-post because this this car isn't having a roll cage um, the owner the owner's uh, adamant that it doesn't have a roll cage and i can understand that from a from a road car point of view it's not so not so nice to have that uh, intrusion on a road car so what we want to do is reinforce the shell in a way that means we don't need to use a roll cage. And one of the areas is going to be reinforcing the inner wing structure into the A post, and then adding reinforcements into the sill structure, reinforcing the way that ties into the B post, and reinforcing the way that that ties into the rear bulkhead. So all of, all of that area we're going to, we're going to address with the extra strength during the fabrication process. And then there's quite a lot of rust repairs on this shell that are not too clever. The inner arch, these arch tubs here have been repaired, not to the original factory join lines. As you can see, they've had a bit of a patchwork put in there, patchwork the other side. The rear, uh, the, the wells in the boot uh, are a bit, uh, have been repaired in the past, again, not very prettily. So we're going to redo those repairs. These arch tubs will be refabricated, so they'll be removed to the original factory uh, flanges, and then they'll, they're going to be replaced anyway with wider arch tubs to match the new carbon bodywork. Uh, so yeah, we, that's the, the beginnings of the foundations of the metalwork path for Quattro. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's nice to get it blasted back, back to bare metal, etched primed and just looking all clean and all, all of its sins on show now. Moving on from that, we'll come to Interceptor. There's been progress on two fronts here. Matt, as you can see, is still working on uh, panel fits and he's pretty rapid progress really with the bonnet area. You, a brief synopsis for new viewers or um, ones with short memories is that the, this is a replacement bonnet scheme. We were, the, the, the car, when it came to us, I'll put my cup down for a minute. Holding, holding on to it as my, uh, as my little coffee cup, uh, <laughs> my crutch as I walk around. I'm going to put it out of the way so I can use both hands to gesticulate. But uh, the car had had a replacement bonnet when it came here uh, as it arrived. However, the bonnet had been made obviously with a new skin and a new frame, but no real uh, view to making sure that the outer profile of the skin was the correct shape when it was spot welded into the frame. So we had to de-spot weld the skin from the frame, which then more or less renders the, the skin scrap. If you, if, if you had to refit it, you could, but it's not really the way you'd want to go. So new skin, 
was got. Uh, that new skin then needed a fair bit of reprofiling, which Matt spent quite a bit of time on, which we've touched on before, but basically just getting the edge profile to follow the same lines as the car. The curvature that way was incorrect, and the curvature that way was more of a W as it was. The, car, the bonnet dived down at this swage line, went up in the middle, and then dived down at that swage line. So it's kind of a W profile across the back. Uh, so Matt's got all that level back up, so it follows the profile of the scuttle, got the curvature down the sides to follow the profile of the wings, got the profile of the front to follow the profile of the slam panel. So all of that now lines up. He's then screwed that to the frame, double checked everything, made sure, got all the alignment bang on, and then spot welded that to the, well then, sorry, then epoxied, uh, we've epoxy coated the inside of the skin and the top of the frame, because there's an inaccessible area trapped, quite a wide inaccessible area trapped all the way around that. So they've been epoxy primed, uh, and then the, uh, the skin's been fitted, spot welded to the frame, Matt spot welded all that to the frame, got that fitted to the car and lined up for the final time, and then got the lead put in place all the way around the bonnet aperture. There's, quite a, there's, a, there's a, a lead fill, it's not, it's not a vast amount of lead, but it, it's a reasonable quantity, all the way around that um, shut line to just close that shut line up and square the corners off. So we've got the lead build in there, paddled that all in pretty, pretty impressively close to the final shape. Uh, I was commenting the other day that he's, his, his skill level is uh, very much in excess of, uh, <laughs> of mine and Stu's in terms of getting, the, getting this to, to the close to the original, close to the correct shape. And that's the key to lead work. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of skill in terms of heat control and that sort of thing, but just being able to not put excess material on. It's very easy to just put loads on and then have a huge job in filing it all back off again. But if you can just put the, almost exactly the right amount on to start with, it saves vast amounts of time and he's doing a very good job of that. Um, and yeah, got all that uh, cut in around the edge, basically puddled in exactly with a sliver of wood uh, to get that pretty close to the final shape all, all the way around the bonnet skin. And now, as you can see, he's filing all that to final shape, and getting all that exactly cut to, to fit with the bonnet. So getting pretty close now in terms of panel fit. So, you know, another week to see this pretty much get in there. I think, I believe, we'll, we'll be very close at that point. And then in parallel with that, Stu's been working on various areas. He's continuing a bit of work now on the door frames because we've still got a bit of an issue with this door frame and this uh, B-pillar uh, trim holding piece, this closing piece here, because this is twisted and the door frame's not quite the right shape. So Stu's been doing a bit more work on getting all that to fit properly, because the, the fit up is generally pretty rubbish on these. And I think that goes for all interceptors. I don't think it's unique to this one. This one's probably got maybe more than its fair share of problems because it's had replacement doors uh, and, a lot, and a huge amount of metal work in the body shell. Most of the metal in the body shell has been replaced. So you're going to always have a few alignment uh, glitches at that point. But I think all interceptors, looking at photographs of them, the door frame fits are not very clever on any of them. So it doesn't come as a great surprise. So Stu's working on that. He's got the uh, gear selector mounting finished off. Now we've, we've had a bit of a, done, done some trial seating in the car, concluded that the seating position is currently too high, but we're gonna have the customer visit and sit in the car and do a trial sit just to check whether his stature is the same as ours. He's quite keen to keep the original Interceptor seats as he's used this car quite a lot in the past. It was his car, it has been his car for many years. So he's actually driven it quite a lot as it was prior to any of this work taking place. Um, so we need to have a sit in, him to have a sit in the car and decide whether something's occurred during the retrim of the seats, which was done prior to the car arriving with us, or, or what's gone on. But basically, to, to, mark, to, to, to me and Cal, the seating position is, is much too high. So, so that needs revising and, and, and addressing. And then Stu's also working on the tail area of the car and the boot, working on the fuel tank setup. One of the issues with the car as it came to us was that we weren't very happy with the fuel filler arrangement. One of the objectives that the customer had was to have give the car a long range fuel tank. The whatever engine whatever big V8 you fit to one of these it's going to use quite a lot of fuel. The originals used a colossal amount of fuel for reasonable performance. The new engine will use a less colossal amount of fuel for a large amount of performance. Uh, but in either case a large fuel tank is required if you don't want to be filling it up too often which was the customer's request. So to that end, quite a bit of the rear end of the car was re-engineered to allow a larger fuel tank. And one thing that was done was moving the fuel filler, which is why it's now up here and not low down on the other side like it normally is on an interceptor. Um, however, the, it, the, the way this had been done, we weren't very happy with. The fuel filler pipe had been put through 
and came through into the boot area and then back out of the boot area, trunk area, uh, and back out of the trunk area to, through a closing panel and down to the fuel tank. And it meant there were Jubilee clipped uh, junctions in the fuel filler with inside the car. And I'm not at all happy with that. I will, I'm, I'm happy enough to run a fuel line within a car if it is a double covered line. If it's a stainless braided, Teflon lined type line, I will be happy to run it inside the car, but not when it's a fuel filler diameter, and certainly not if it's a pushed on connection with a Jubilee clip on it. The chances that if, if in an accident that parted company inside the car, the fuel leakage in the car would be colossal, and it is really just not something I want to do. I'm not, not happy with that arrangement at all. So we've re-engineered the fuel filler now, uh, with, that's going to go down and go into the bottom of the tank. There's no problem with feeding the fuel into the tank from the bottom as long as you're clearing the air from the top. So we're just going to reroute that fuel filler down the wheel arch and into the bottom of the tank where it doesn't need to go through the inside of the car anyway. But that does leave the breather, tank breather, which cleared, not the, not the breather that breathes the tank while the engine's running, but the breather to allow you to fill the tank without, uh, without it uh, air locking. That will be from the top of the tank, obviously, to let the air out, but it needs to bring the, it needs to present the air to the upper part of the fuel filler neck. Uh, and that kind of almost meant it needed to come through the car. Now, Stu's found a little gap that we've got where we can get from the top of the fuel tank out through the chassis side blade, or through, the, through the sort of upper chassis rail, if you like, we call them a blade, um, through that and then up and into the top of the filler neck, kind of in this area here. It's hard to sort of gesticulate to at the moment. Uh, and that meant going through the chassis blade. So Stu's basically cut a tube through the chassis blade, lower down than the tube that came inside the boot originally, uh, and then put a little bulkhead inside that to take uh, an AN8 uh, fuel union, half inch bore, uh, half inch JIC fuel union that goes through, uh, through the chassis blade. And then we can have a pipe, a flexible pipe from the top of the tank screwed to one side of that, and another flexible pipe screwed to the other side of that bulkhead union that will come up and uh, screw onto the fuel filler net just, just behind here, basically, behind the inside the quarter panel. That'll screw on there. That'll all be out, outboard of the inside of the car, so no, 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 no fuel unions within the inside, in the passenger compartment, so to speak. Uh, and then he's moved then on to making this new cover. The original cover was steel, incredibly heavy, and had a cutout in the corner for where the aforementioned fuel feed pipe went through. So not happy with that. So Stu's made a new cover in aluminium. Uh, in, we were going to do it in two millimetre. We changed plan to three millimetre just so it's super strong. I mean, it's 5,000 series, three mil alley. You, you're going to be able to stamp on that and not change its shape very much. So throwing a few bags in there isn't going to do any harm to it. And then he's used the pull max, Pell's nibbler. <laughs> Chooses to identify as a pull max um, machine to put the, uh, the uh, swages into that. And I was just commenting earlier, actually, prior to doing this video, that it's pretty impressive. If it, you, you realise the value of a machine like that, it, that, c that can put these uh, 25 mil wide flutes, uh, which are around three millimetres deep, into three millimetre thick uh, 5251 H22 aluminium sheet. That's some force being exerted. That is quite hard material to swage. So that, uh, that tells you all you need to know about the, machine, the forces that machine can exert. It's quite impressive. So that's where we're at on that at the moment. I think that picks everything up uh, reasonably there. We'll go past the E-Type this week because that's going to be in Cal's department, that one. That's, uh, the, 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 the work on that is uh, in the CAD layer. And we'll move on to the Allegra. I'm going to walk over to this side, actually, then I can gesticulate at things. I'll briefly touch on this. Uh, panel fit-up, we saw last week that we'd started on the front wing fit-up and we're having a quick look at the quarter panels. But things have obviously moved on uh, and the panel fit-up's going on on the rear now but at that point i'm going to hand over to bobby and let him explain all of that because uh, he's he's the he's leading and spearheading the work on that so over to bobby hi everyone um so we're back on the allegro um a bit more exciting stuff going on here so we got the rear quarters from ks back last week till the end of last week and uh, yeah we just offer them uh, on the car and uh, so far so good, it's, uh, the fitment is, is okay, there's a bit, a, a few differences between the, the, the both shells, so you would expect that the uh, yeah, uh, Leyland was not so precise at the time and uh, yeah, because we had the scan done on the other car and then we fit the, the panels first on this car, so yeah, there, there's small adjustments here and there, but nothing major and uh, it all fits as it should. 
Uh, bear in mind that the whole thing was scanned and designed uh, purely on a, on a computer, uh, on a 3D uh, uh, model, if you wish. And uh, uh, the fitment from being uh, completely virtual to actually having a physical part and fit it on the car, uh, it's uh, remarkable. It's, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want for, yeah, you wouldn't expect any more, to be honest. Yeah, so panel fitted, uh, the rear quarter, um, both sides are done. Uh, we just had it temporarily uh, with click holes on the, the top flange and uh, some bolts around the flanges where uh, later that will be bonded to the body. And uh, yeah, we just tweak here and there the, the body show because we, we was expecting that we're going to modify the metal to see the carbon fiber. That's, that was uh, uh, the idea. Uh, yesterday we took off the skin of the door and uh, I made a, a, a brace here because as soon as I took off the, the skin, the door kind of sucked a little bit, so we lost the, the, the initial gaps. So I've done that. Uh, I've done also some uh, C clips. I'll show you on here. That's just a, a 16 mil uh, square tube. And uh, yeah, uh, well, they're not there. So that allows us to fit the, the skin on the door and uh, clamp it and this actually give us the opportunity to open and close the door, check the gaps and all what, uh, without drilling actually holes in the skin because when you offer the skin and it's off with five mil, you drill one hole and then you, oh, you're just with three mil, you drill another hole so we end up with the, with the, with the holes all over the place. Um, so we've been doing that uh, for the last few days and uh, so far so good. Right, well, thank you, Bobby, for that. That's uh, better explained than I, than I could explain it, so it's very good. But yeah, really good to see progress forging ahead on the Allegros. It just, just feels nice to see these finally coming together now. Now we've got the, the parts to, uh, to, to get them finished. We, we can really forge ahead and get these, get these completely done. Um, and at that point, I think we're going to we'll wander over to the body shop, make Jamie run around everything, our obstacle course in the workshop. Um, there's various progress on various fronts here, but I think on that I'm going to hand over to Mark again and let him ably explain the, uh, the, the progress in the body shop area. All right, thanks Nat. Okay, so this week in the body shop, um, Churchill I've just started back on because I've been stripping the HJC. Um, there's still 320 in going round. Got like the detail work to do before I start the um, wet flat. But it's going to be a bit slow this week because I've got to drop off and do stuff for assembly, painting, parts and for them to get together. Um, and then the M3 over here is progressing. All the panels are start, um, 320 blocked, I think. Steve's just doing the wings. Uh, the boot lid's down there. Like I say, the shell's done. So they can get, they're going to get everything dry blocked and then it'll be a wet flat session. And then um, just um, had a good tidy up in here because it's like dusty Springfield lately with all the dust off everything. And then here's Steve trying to run away. All right, Stephen, come back, Steve. Very shy. There you go, Naomi, he does work. All right, we'll take you to the booth. He's in the booth. Oh, here he is again! <laughs> Working hard. All right, so, like I said in last week's, we got everything polyestered and now it's all in epoxy. So, Steve will start badgering away, getting these blocks 320. And, like I say, once everything's 320, then it's a massive wet flat session to get to final paint. So, not much happened this week, apart from a lot of dusty stuff. So yeah, we better crack on. So go on, bugger off. See you next week. Right, well, thanks for that, Mark. And we'll proceed back out into the workshop. And it's nearly time to hand over to Cal, but there's one more thing we'll touch on because there's a lot more to uh, the business uh, than just the little walk around of looking at cars, that, as, as you might expect. There's a lot of things going on in the background. And one of the things going on in the background is just maintenance on all sorts of things. 
I did quite a few uh, little jobs um, at the beginning of doing my blasting session in there, just b various maintenance jobs that need to be done there, which are fairly boring. I might go into them another time. But one uh, really necessary job is actually going on in the paint booth now, which I'm going to hand over to Mark to uh, explain a bit more in a minute. But the, we only have one booth, so all of our primer work and all of our application of Raptor, basically all of our coatings get applied in that booth which means that the filters get blocked at quite a dramatic rate, not the intake filters, but the extract filters in the floor. It's a full floor extract booth, so the whole of that floor grid area is covered in, uh, is covered in uh, fiberglass uh, mesh filter, or a uh, fluff, fiberglass fluff, I don't know what you call it, but basically a, a floor filter that catches all of the particulates that are being drawn out of the booth and stop them going up our chimney. Uh, the whole of that floor area is covered in that filter. And it gets blocked at quite a rate, particularly if we're applying sticky coatings like Raptor. And once that's stuck to that uh, mesh, that matting, it then sticks every other coating to it. So it blocks them up quite quickly. So one of the jobs we have to do is change those filters. And that's about to be done. We try and time that to be done just before we're doing a final paint. Um, and we also coat the walls with a coating which A, makes them white, and B, catches all of the uh, dirt and debris an overspray to prevent it getting prevent it staying airborne in there and again that needs to be changed but I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Mark and let him elaborate on that a little bit so this week this drilling task of refurbing this get all this skin off because Gaz likes to just spray everything up the walls as usual oh yeah have a go Jamie have a go at that look at that it's nice when it all comes off in one, but when some, um, well, I can't say the words on um, TV, but gets the paint on the walls and it eats into it, but oh well. Yeah, so a couple of hours in here, get this ripped off, take this, because we've just done a lot of primer and Raptor work. Is this in readiness to paint you done? Well, yeah, the M3 and the Churchill, we need it spick and span. Also got Segola coming in, paint um, spray gun company. We're going to do a bit of promotional work with them. So I want it all nice. It usually is nice, but it takes its toll with primer and um, Raptor. So yeah, a fun two hours in here. Well, thanks for that, Mark. And at that point, I think we're pretty much covered here. I'm sure there'll be a tangent I can go off on at some point next week, um, but I'm going to leave it at that for this week and hand over to Cal. Okay, Duke. Right, thank you very much, Nat. Uh, let's see what's going on in here. Uh, quite a lot, actually. Um, Going to start with the Camaro because that Summit Racing order turned up, which was good uh, and allowed quite a few avenues of progress on this. So, sill trims. Uh, I'm going to have a total mental block now and forget the name of the company these were done by. But basically, they're billet, billet sill trims from a company that does them in the States. I forget the name of them. Uh, they fit absolutely perfectly, which I was a little bit nervous about. I almost didn't buy them because I thought, knowing how inaccurate the fit often is on pressed metal ones, but you can get away with it because they just kind of flex into shape. I thought, God, if we have billet ones and they're not exactly the right profile, they're not just going to press into shape. Uh, however, they were exactly the right profile. Um, so very happy with that. Uh, and the B-pillar vents, which I think Anthony had generally a complete nightmare with, not because the B-pillar vents are badly made or wrong, I think because the quarter panels, are probably because they're repro quarter panels, I'm guessing the vent detail and the structure behind was slightly different because he had multiple problems. The, the shape wasn't quite right of the actual hole. Then there's a structural bit behind there, which was overlapping the area that I had to go into, which was also in the way. So uh, some careful uh, die grinding and an illustration. I mean, these vents were something I decided to put in more recently rather than the original plastic ones, but they're an illustration of why one should always take one's dry build to the nth degree with all of the final parts rather than original parts which might then get changed later um, and then the switches for the window cranks is what he's working on at the minute so we're using these uh, switch units that basically replace the where the spindle position is for the original manually cranked windows so you put the original window crank on but it becomes a switch so it's just push one way for or push the other way for down might be able to do some clever pdm programming on that i've got a similar system on uh, Kaiser 2 over there and because of the PDM electronics I've actually put some programming in that such that you can control the passenger door from the driver's side with only the one handle because that that is the limitation of the 
crank handle window control is that you can't normally control the passenger side window from the driver's side. Um, however, on that, I've done it such that if you do a very momentary click the opposite direction before the direction you want, it does the opposite window. Um, so that's that. And then the window mouldings also arrived. Um, so again, we're just checking all of that because it was all mocked up with the original mouldings. And obviously there is the potential for these mouldings to be slightly different. Now, actually, as it is, they're pretty good. The only one that was noticeably different was the top one on the front windscreen. However, as luck would have it, that didn't have any damage on it. It's just some small scratches. So I think we're going to polish them out and use the original front one again. Um, so yeah, it'd be cool to get them in. It's kind of all coming together actually quite well. We get Once he's done the switch on this door, we can get the door panels on. We're still, a, the jury's are out a bit at the minute on whether we're going to do custom ones or not. I actually not offended at all by the original door cards and they're in really good condition. Um, that wasn't the original plan with the car. However, I think they're going to look pretty smart. Once we've got the seats back, um, which are being done in like a, I think it's Porsche saddle, it's like a chocolatey brown leather. I think they'll look great. And then, yeah, we'll get the glass in, parcel shelf can go in, rear, quarter, rear seat will be able to go in when that's dropped off. Um, and yeah, it's going to look, it's going to look like a proper car. Um, and speaking of the upholstery, uh, that is the domain of Dean Trimworks, who is our go-to upholsterer, who happens to be here at the moment. Um, I don't know if he's nestling over there somewhere, but he's basically come over to do the cage upholstery. Let me just have a quick sip of this. So he's come to do the cage upholstery and also drop off the boot carpets, which I've just dropped into place. They look great. Um, that's kind of now sown the seed of excitement to get that trim panel in, get the rear damper reservoirs in their billet housings, which aren't in at the minute, but we've done these really nice billet housings that are bronze anodized, which is like the accent color on this car. So instrument bezels, top of the gear knob, speaker grill badges, and the damper reservoir mounts, plus the wheels and the fuel cap are all in that uh, bronze accent color. So that's gonna look great. And then Dean's just in the process of doing the cage. So what we've basically got is these uh, flat strips that have been stitched each side and then they'll be wrapped around and then basically hand stitched much like you do a steering wheel it'll hand stitch between the, the stitch loops on each side in a zigzag pattern um, and as I've mentioned previously we were looking at the jeopardy of trying to actually upholster around the curves which looked like it would be impossible without getting some really bad puckering on the inner part of the curve so we're 3d printing uh, corner finishes which will be upholstered separately and applied afterwards so um, as soon as Dean's finished with that cage upholstery stuff we will then be able to put the parcel shelf in Gibbo this week has just been trial fitting these uh, the covers that we've done for the damper adjusters on the back so they're they're basically a billet machined cover and then we've done a, a 3d printed section underneath that the top part is bonded to and that has uh, a, a large coarse thread in it and we've done them 3D printed because we could we could basically latch them into place by springing them in, pushing them in, letting them spring out again. And then of course, that's the female thread. When you screw the male thread into it, it holds it sprung out. So it was a, a cunning way of latching those into the, the sort of um, lip around that aperture on the metal uh, without needing to have any sort of mounting holes because we didn't want any bolts sort of visible on the rear shelf. So, and then you just screw the top covers on. Um, main parcel shelf's ready to go in. Dean's just dropped off the rear bit, which I think's on, on the back of the Jensen there um, in Alcantara. So that'll be ready to go in. Uh, so yeah, at the point that cage stuff's done, we can do all of that. We can get all the rear panels in here. At that point, we can get the glass in because we've only really not put that in because we wanted access to the cage to be a bit easier. Um, boot carpets are all ready to go. They're, they're loosely in, really happy with that, so they can be glued in. And then, yeah, we can just work our way forwards, really. Um, the mirrors, you saw them arrive last week. I've now sent the bezels and noses of those to be anodized, along with possibly the world's largest anodizing batch. Um, I think in total, we had 103 parts stacked up, ready to go for anodizing. Um, so when that lot comes back, that'll in, in, include the mirror parts and the instrument uh, uh, binnacle for this um, and that is the last piece to allow us to get all the door cards, cards built up get all the dash built up um, pretty much then proceed with finishing off the rest of the interior Alex is working on the engine wiring but that's coming on nicely I'd say he's got a couple of days more to go on that and that can go into place um, so yeah it's, it's kind of all coming together which uh, I've been hoping for for a while there's just been a couple of little hold up areas um, which we couldn't have really foreseen. One of which actually was the 
bonnet and boot lid, uh, which I believe are literally being done at the moment. I'd, I was shown a video of the boot lid inner and the bonnet inner the other day. Um, our plan is we're going to get those as separate pieces and actually bond the inners and outers together here. So the inners are um, visible, we sort of VQ they call it, so visible quality carbon, so it'll have like a herringbone pattern on the weave, and then the outers just um, in the body panel system uh, carbon, so it has a, a sort of coating on it that, that avoids uh, primer and paint sinkage into it. Um, so the outers will be a painted finish, the, the inners will be a visible weave finish, so when you open the bonnet it'll be visible carbon on the under, underside. But we're getting them as two separate pieces so we can basically mount the inner, bolt it in place, latch it down on the bonnet, make sure the shape of that's all right, do all the trimming and fettling of the outer, get that sitting over perfectly, make sure it all matches the curve of the wings and then clamp it into place. And it's something we basically had to do because of the lead time on the carbon stuff. Um, we had no real option but to paint the rest of the shell and then follow with the carbon bits later which obviously has a, an injection of jeopardy but that's why we're doing the inner and outer separately and bonding them on the car to make sure the profiles match perfectly. So slight you know, potential for trauma ahead on that but hopefully it'll all go well and we'll probably have all those components here next week. Um, so that's Escorts, I think Givo's also been chipping away at some more jobs on Kuma. Um, What's he been up to on that? So the diff, we got the, we had the two faulty diff casings, Project 1 one already in, Kuma 1 went back in this week. He's been working on the, trimming all the carpet sections for this car uh, and just basically niggling away at the jobs that needed doing to bring this one up to the same position as the other one. Uh, and then we've got, so this um, Project Kaiser 2, we were waiting for the rear hubs back from Simply Performance. I think we just got them back in last week's video. Anthony got them refitted. I took this for a test drive on the first available reasonable weather day, which was, I think, Monday or Tuesday this week. Uh, and sure enough, the bearing noise is gone. So that's uh, nice that that was a positive result on that. So I'm just trickling through another couple of little jobs on this. The GPS wasn't getting a decent signal. So I think that may be because I was trying to be clever and hide that behind the wooden vent panel that sits on the dash. Um, so I'm going to try and sort that out so it gets a better signal. Um, I think it was something, oh, there was a bit of a rattle at the back end, which I've been trying to find the source of. And I think I actually found it yesterday. I think it was the subwoofer rattling back and forth on its mounts in the, in the boot when you go over bumps. I think it was kind of vibrating and rattling on the panel that, it, that sort of hides it at the side of the boot. So that's that. Uh, Utah is ready to go. So that's tomorrow. I think that's going to be picked up. Um, and then in the meantime, up in the CAD layer, uh, in fact, should we go up to the CAD layer? Let's go up to the CAD layer. I said I was going to do a transition up there, but I feel like challenging Jamie and we'll walk up and see if he can fall up the stairs. <laughs> I feel like there was something else to mention down here as well, but perhaps not. Oh, well, I'll tell you what I will mention actually, Audi. Um, Nat obviously has just shown you the uh, body shell post blast for the Quattro. Um, but in the meantime, we've been getting various other bits ready. So Dave Rowe is going to be doing the uh, engine build. If you don't know who Dave Rowe is, uh, EPS Motorsport is his uh, business, which primarily revolves around um, motorsport electronic systems, harness builds, mapping, that sort of thing. Um, but he's, he's got a pretty cool couple of Quattro builds. The one he's working on now uh, is basically a Group S replica. So that's, it's kind of a replica, but probably executed much more nicely than of the original Group S Quattro that never actually got used. I think that's right. In, I'm right in saying Jamie behind the camera. He's the aficionado of all things rally. So, uh, so check out his videos, actually. Um, that build is going to be something spectacular. Uh, but he will be doing the engine build for our Quattro project. Uh, so he's dropped me off a donor engine. We've just, just got a donor, well, a mock-up turbo from Turbo Smart. Um, so we can start planning out the layout and the engine bay. We've also done a 3D print of the intake manifold that Dave designed for his 20 valve powered Quattro. He calls it Ray. Um, it's basically a Pikes Peak short wheelbase Quattro build that he did quite a few years ago now. Um, but uh, his intake manifold design for that looks amazing. So we've done a 3D print of that for our mock-up build with the intention of using uh, the same manifold on that. Um, and we've got the transmission here, which Dave also sourced for us. So the idea is once we've got the Quattro jigged in there and we've gone through all the rust repair stuff, the starter dry build will we get the engine and box mated up, get them in the car, get the intake manifold 3D print on there, 
get the turbo kind of positioned where we want it and we'll get a, a probably a billet collector from Elma Racing uh, and then we can kind of fill in the blanks make the exhaust manifold and then plan out the rest of the engine bay layout from there so that's something that's going on in the background and then in here uh, these chaps are beavering away. Uh, so <laughs> looks like frantically going. Oh, I'm looking at Jensen. <laughs> My computer's frozen. That's what always happens every time he walks in. <laughs> I don't actually work this slowly. Uh, so multiple things actually. He's looking at that Jensen interceptor dash, relating to the interior design work for the Jensen. Uh, now I think it was earlier this week he scanned the dash structure, transmission tunnel floor, steering wheel on the interceptor so we can start working on the console design and dash layout which are really the only custom bits on that the, the seats door cards most of the rear trim panels are all going to be standard the dash will be essentially a standard um, basic shape of dash but we'll have, the instrument layout will be a bit different and then the console is going to be a complete scratch build it'll be a nod to the original but obviously because the transmission tunnel is different the shape of it will be different um, and we're going to have a load of different components on there so again it's all it's all going to be kind of not a radical departure like the E-Type that we're doing, but much more nicely executed. So nicer quality switches on there. We'll probably have a nav screen in there. Uh, the HVAC controls have got to go in there. So just, just sort of clean, nicely executed, but it's worth planning out the layout at this point. So everybody's on the same page. We can show these renderings to the customer as we, as we get them done. Um, and then he's been on with the E-Type. So this is what is now Project Geneva actually we, we had a change of direction uh, all relating to the same story that most people most E-Type fans will be familiar with the infamous Norman Jewis uh, run to G the Geneva Motor Show um, so on Project Geneva the rear end Luke's been working on the egg crate book as they would normally be called uh, which is basically a crisscross lattice of um, two-dimensional profiles which will be cut in MDF, all interlocked together to basically create the pattern of the shape of the rear end. So that can be used as a book to check the shape of the panels against as they're made, the metal panels as they're made. Um, and there are some hard sections around the arches and most of the rear end will be solid points that are machined in epoxy or urethane tooling block. So that on those bits, the tool can actually be used to hammer form those sections over because there's quite a, a sharp in, um, sort of dimple where the number plate goes. And obviously the arch lip itself is going to be a sharp angle change. So on those bits, it, it serves not just as a sort of reference to put the metal over to check it, but it may also be that the, the shape is hammer formed over that in those areas. So that's looking pretty good. I'm going to sort of to and fro a little bit with Andy Hall, who's going to be doing the metal work on that rear end to make sure he's happy. We were juggling the profiling the edges versus not obviously on our cnc router we've got the option that the edges of the two the mdf panels could be chamfered to an angle so if you imagine where all of those profiles meet the body the edges will be angled technically if they meet completely flush now you can either do it with the edges profile like that or you could just have a square edge on them and it only touch on the closest edge and there's pros and cons to both um, so i'm kind of <laughs> liaising with andy on that on uh, which is the best bit to have profiled and which bits are best not to have profiled um, but that's uh, the other thing luke's been on with um, and also finalizing the dash layout in uh, project geneva we pretty much have finalized the layout now it's just ironing, closely inspecting all the surfacing and making sure there's no ripples everything everything's the right shape essentially because that will be going straight to being a machine tool to make the carbon fiber piece that is going to form that console and dash structure uh, and then george has been on well it's starting on uh, the reliance scimitar project which has been mentioned it's probably not been dwelled on greatly because the car is not actually in here at the minute we had it here so we could 3d scan it for the purposes of doing this initial design work um, and now it's gone into storage um, but yes we're working on how to create a wide track uh, bigger wheeled interpretation of a scimitar um, that, <laughs> that basically won't look terrible um, and it's uh, it's proving some challenges it's always interesting at this phase you know you have kind of a, a, a general idea of how it's going to look in your head it's only when you start laying it out in 3d that the, the sort of intricacies of what will work and what won't work become apparent and one of the challenges at the minute is there's originally like a body line straight down the side you know, a style line straight down the side of the car but if you flare the arches out massively 
you have to decide what to do with that style line and you could run it over the flared arches but that generally doesn't look great unless you have a very very smooth kind of balloon shape to the, the quarter and the wing which is not really where we're going with it you can just taper it out where the arch flare starts but that tends to look a bit half-assed and not not quite intentional so we're trying, trying to work out we were going to bring it down the side of the car right from the front over the front arch because we thought we could manage that and then basically end it where the door handle is so then there is no style line behind that and so you don't have to work out how that react how that basically behaves with the big swelled out rear arch on it but we're really struggling with the style line ending up too high if you leave yourself enough land to transition the width of the front arch below it so we were just having a quick chat uh, an hour ago about maybe introducing a vent behind the front wheel not having the style line over the front arch at all and then having a style line appear from the top edge of the vent behind the front wheel and then going all the way down the side of the, the door and ending at the door handle then it will remain to be seen whether that looks worthwhile or not so we're actually at that stage where we're just roughing stuff out we've got we've got the shape of the original shell from a scan we've, we know the, the rough wheel and tire size we want to run we know the track width that's going to be on the chassis we're doing so it's just trying to create a body that does the original justice gives us the track width we want and doesn't have unresolved areas um, like things like these style lines and if you don't have it there at all i think it's going to look as we were saying earlier two kit car and that's always the the, the risk with this sort of thing it's if you just everything just becomes kind of smoothed out and bubbly it looks too kit car um, there needs to be some defined um, you know details to the design um, but working out how they all interact is always the challenge so good luck with that George <laughs> um, and I think I'm gonna wander back out here but I suspect that is actually everything um, let's, let's let's go out onto the veranda and just check <laughs> <laughs> but I think, yeah, that's it. Um, so on that note, we shall uh, see you next week. <laughs>